So what do we have here? You know what this is if you saw the previous video. I got all the stuff necessary to make myself comfortable at no matter what angle or position I need to sit in. I also have a kerosene heater that I use to preheat my whole garage prior to applying an engine coating that I've talked about in other videos. I got my Dremel hung from the rafters on a chain that I can use to adjust the height of the electric motor so that the shaft can reach wherever it needs to reach without stress or being stretched. And all the tooling and supplies needed to clean out and prepare the crankcase for the coating it's about to receive. There's a wrench for changing tools and some tin snips for opening the blister pack of wire brushes. I use that to prevent emergency room visits. That's all I need it for. But anyway, there's several kinds of respirators out there and there's no one size fits all solution for this job. Different phases of the job will require different protective gear. There's the old tried and true dust mask, which is perfect for grinding and sanding the casting because the particles that become airborne are not toxic. You still don't want to breathe them. This dust mask is one of the nicer ones with a valve that opens when you exhale so that less condensation occurs inside the filter material. These typically fit better than the El Cheapo kinds, but either would work. Sorry the exposure got so blown out here, I'm, I like having tons of light over my workspace for stuff like this. I did all the messy grinding work in a different video already, so we're probably not going to use this today because they fog up my safety glasses. Use a face shield with these to eliminate that problem. Next we have a paint respirator. These cost more and they have huge fine particle filters that offer better protection than a simple dust mask, but they offer no chemical filtration whatsoever to protect you from hazardous chemicals. This microfiltration is intended to absorb paint particles. I'll be working with a paint that uses organic solvents for its base that evaporate rapidly and pose health hazards. So I have to use an organic OVP100 respirator. If you're unfamiliar with these, they filter at a minimum of 99.7% efficiency removing impurities from the air. They offer a particulate filter layer and a bonded carbon layer. This is a North Silicone half mask respirator with Honeywell OVP100 filters. There are dozens of different kinds of cartridges that fit this mask and for different respiratory purposes, but OVP100 filters are precisely what you need for the coating that I'm using. Additionally, I'm using disposable gloves, Q-tips, coffee filters, acid brushes, plastic spoons, wire brushes, and chemicals like mineral spirits, denatured alcohol, and 2 plus 2 gum cutter. I'll introduce you to anything else that I use in my arsenal if I decide to use something else. This engine sat for four years. Sorry, really I am. It's not good for engine parts to do this. But apparently, I did touch it when I mounted it on the engine stand. Someone did anyway. They left their rusty fingerprints on the block. Maybe I can track them down. Looks like they were grabbing all over the suitcase handles too. There's a little bit of rust inside this block. Nothing that can't easily be fixed before we begin. All of the machine surfaces are in flawless condition. It just looks like crust and rust that I can easily clean right up with a wire wheel on a Dremel. If you saw the previous Gliptol video, then you'd know that that's one of the surface preparations that I have to do anyway prior to application. So this is no big deal to me. Time to glove up and set up. Because all of the heavy grinding is done and the crankcase casting lines and imperfections have been removed, all I'm going to do is wire wheel down all the surfaces where my coating will be applied, or where I see surface rust. These are just steel Harbor Freight rotary wire wheels sold as a 5-pack for super cheap. I might use $2 worth of materials on this, but you're about to see 3 hours go by in a flash. So with my crusty old safety glasses on, it's time to scuff the surface of this thing and get started. I start with a small cup brush to detail the extremities, and then tackle the large areas with the larger cup brush. It didn't take me long to figure out that I needed to use the squished cylinder head dowel pin on the end of the flex shaft to protect the block from the chuck of the flex cable. I forgot all about this thing, and it helps to protect your precision machine work from this kind of hazard. It didn't take long to bring that shine right back out that was on it before the post-machining washing, burn-off oven powder coating and baking. Engine parts that sit for long periods of time should be oiled, and I intentionally didn't oil this crankcase at all. I coated machine surfaces for the bores and mains with automatic transmission fluid, and I left it shrink-wrapped and double-bagged indoors on an engine stand. I didn't want to oil surfaces that I knew I would apply a coating to because I want that coating to stick. There's no oil left in this block after what it's been through. I'm lucky that the all wood interior of my insulated garage has prevented humid days and extreme temperature snaps from becoming a problem here. Now for the big brush. I cover all the large flat surfaces first and then go back over all the places I just scrubbed up with a detail brush as best as I can to blend it. We're getting to the finishing stretch here. One of the places it's particularly hard to reach is the front balance shaft housing. I don't know if I did a bad job cleaning it the first time or if a lot of sand and carbon leached out during the powder coat baking. 
But all this stuff has to go before I coat it, or else I'm going to be painting a sacrificial layer that might compromise the coating later. Absolutely every surface to be coated has to be abraded and scuffed up. Next, it's time to wash out all the funk we just stirred up with a petroleum-based solvent. This is an aerosol spray bottle that you can fill with whatever will fit through the nozzle and replaceable aerosol canisters to propel it. I'm using mineral spirits here because it penetrates, lifts out oil and dirt, and dries up completely in a short period of time. Basically, the way this stage of preparation works is like this. Soak it all down first and mash the parts cleaning brush deep into all the nooks and crannies to loosen anything that's trying to hide. Keep the block well saturated. Then flip the block over, spray it out again, brush out all the oil galleries, and wash out all the cylinder bores. Use coffee filters to wipe down every surface, whether you're coating it or not, to remove all of its residue. Coffee filters let you see how dirty these surfaces are. They need to come out clean and white before you're done with this step. You may find that you have to wipe the block clean and reapply several times before achieving that result. Coffee filters aren't particularly absorbent, but who cares? You get a thousand of them for ten bucks. It would take twelve rolls of paper towels to produce a thousand sheets. But paper towels are still the wrong thing to use for engine cleaning and assembly for many reasons, and you don't need absorbency to clean an engine block. You need elbow grease. Based on all of the feedback I've seen in my other videos, you guys clearly get it by now how well coffee filters really work for this. I know my mom watches these videos because I get ice cube trays and coffee filters for Christmas every year. Cast iron is porous, and I sprayed a highly refined petroleum-based solvent on it. It evaporates very rapidly, but it also penetrates deeply, and stuff that penetrates will evaporate more slowly. It'll carry oil and impurities back out of the pores of the metal as it evaporates, so I like to give the surface adequate time to gas out before proceeding. Once I'm satisfied that there's no foreign material left inside the block, I clean up my mess and I let it sit for a few hours to fully gas out before I proceed. And here's what I've come back to. This is the cleanest used engine I think I've ever achieved. And these are crucial preparation steps for the crazy thing that I'm about to do. Really, if I wasn't using this engine the way I'm going to use it, I'd never go through this kind of effort or do anything like this to a build. I'd be putting bearings, crank, rods, pistons in it right now and putting it right back to work. But according to the label of the product I'm using, I've got to keep going with the cleaning prep. Mineral spirits was just the degreasing phase. Now I have to clean off any residue that surfaced after the mineral spirits evaporated. The tools and procedures for the alcohol surface preparation are exactly the same as with the mineral spirits. Denatured alcohol is a residue-free solvent. It's not anywhere near as effective as petroleum-based solvents like mineral spirits are for degreasing soiled engine parts, but it does a great job at loosening and removing dirt and oil so that it can be wiped away before it evaporates, leaving behind no residue. Industrial painters often use it to clean and etch the surfaces that they're about to paint to help the paint penetrate the surface better and to prevent fish eyes from occurring from dust or chemical contamination. I'm turning on some ventilation for this next segment. Denatured alcohol vapors aren't necessarily toxic, but it is a poison if you ingest it, like if you drink it or absorb it through your skin. Because I'm a denatured alcoholic, I prefer not to even smell it. By no means are the things that I'm doing here a necessary part of engine building. This is purely elective. Though other people have done this before me, and for decades, and with a variety of different kinds of coatings, which I'm sure you'll see discussed in the comments, to me this is just an educational experiment. I'm following the lead of people who blazed this trail long before me, and I'm following the application instructions of a product while using it for a purpose it wasn't even designed for. I've never done this before. To those of you who know what my channel's all about, you know it's a documentary of me doing things that other people have already done just with a camera pointed at it. This is a treatment that I have faith in because of the testimonies of people I trust, as well as positive feedback and experiences others have shared in my previous video's comments. There are a few benefits in this application, and the ones that it does offer are very specific. The necessity of these benefits will be viewed differently by nearly every mechanic out there, and that necessity may also vary from one engine to the next. The vast majority of people watching this might not get this or might feel uncomfortable watching someone paint the inside of a crankcase. That's okay, it makes me uncomfortable too. I'm using acid brushes for several reasons. One is that my coating requires a non-synthetic brush, otherwise it will dissolve the bristles. Acid brushes are made from horsehair, and they won't melt in this coating's powerful solvent base. They're cheap, effective, disposable, and I can bend them into any shape I need to reach into wherever it is that I need to paint without feeling guilty for destroying a high-quality brush. 
Plus, I don't have to bother with cleaning them up when I'm done. The one drawback with their cheapness is that they tend to shed. The bristles aren't glued in, and they drop bristles occasionally. Bending them doesn't actually help that situation either. You can accidentally leave horse hairs on or in your work, so whether or not you bend them, pay attention to the brush quality as well as the surface you're painting. You have to pluck a hair out here and there from time to time to keep things tidy. If you weren't paying attention, you missed how to make a super long reach brush. The rest of this is pretty simple. Paint it, let it dry, paint it again, let it dry again, bake at 280 degrees for two hours. Anyway, it's go time. I've just got to get my paint, my protective gear, and my music ready. There's nothing really else I can add to make this more interesting except for some Rojo Del Chocolate. So let's roll! <laughs> Bye.